arrogant approach uh, after the 2024 general elections. They must know that they're going to get nothing. If they come to us with the attitude that they want Ramaphosa or nothing, they will get absolutely nothing. So Mbalula is in the Tule House. So, the Tule House is not in charge of government. I only got to be staying in residence when I was SRC president. When you have defeated these old people with yeah. ideological persuasion, sure. they say, no, but we cannot do this because they won't agree. Hmm. And then they say, Who, who who's they? I the village which I grew up in. Actually, electricity was only installed in 2010 or 2011. <laughs> Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. And today I'm extremely excited to be joined by the Deputy President of the Economic Freedom Fighters, Mr. Floyd Shivambu. Thank you so much no, for thank you. Us. Thank you for inviting us to this uh, very progressive platform. The pleasure is ours. Thank you so much for honoring our invitation. Yes. How did you first meet Julius Malema? Uh, I've actually got to meet him when I was going to the Congress of South African uh, Students Congress, SASCO. Yeah. I think that was in 2004. And then I was a candidate for Secretary General of SASCO at that time. Right. So in one of the caucuses, like uh, he was not in SASCO that time, he was a provincial secretary of the ANC Youth League okay. in Limpombo. And then the Congress of Sasko was taking place in the University of Limpombo Teflop campus. Mm. So in one of the deliberations, you know, when people are consolidating numbers, then I, I see he <laughs> enters, he says that, oh, this is our candidate, we're going to win with this candidate. Uh, yeah. But I had obviously known him and I've known about him uh, because he was a leader of COSAS and a leader of the ANC Youth League. But uh, in that Congress, I was a candidate then. He was uh, very much involved in uh, wow. trying to support my candidate to be a Secretary General uh, of SAS. Nice. That, is what, that is how we got uh, to meet. And uh, that is how we got to meet. And then the other time when I had a far much more solid impression mm -hmm. was when I was in the National Committee of the Young Communist League and I was presiding mm -hmm. over a provincial uh, congress of the Young Communist League in Limpopo. And then he came to speak uh, on behalf of the ANC Youth League. And he spoke far much more emphatically in terms of uh, the agenda which uh, had to constitute the, the programs of young people um, at that time. But also he spoke clear left politics, uh, which was contrary to the dominant narrative of ANC Youth League leaders at that particular period. Because we had uh, a lot of uh, ANC Youth League leaders who were repeating after the national leaders. Mm, this was in the Mbeki the, era. And yes, like during the Mbeki era. And uh, so that is how uh, it used to be. But he was like having a very distinct voice yeah. in terms of uh, what got to happen. So Interesting. we got to uh, have a, a, a far much closer political association and relationship uh, from that particular period. And how did you become so tight and, and kind of political allies and friends at the same time, because I've always seen you together, but the actual personal story is something I've, I've never known. So the, uh, the, when I left the university, like uh, when I left Vets University, yeah. I went to work for the South African Communist Party and COSAT as a head of policy and political education. So we used to conduct political schools for unions mm. in different sectors, in the mining sector, in the public service, yeah. in education, on a variety of other areas. So I had previously served in the National Executive Committee of SASCO, mm. and I was also in the National uh, Committee of the Young Communist League. And when I was a student activist, I think I had gained some prominence as a youth activist, mostly because I used to write a lot of perspectives mm. 
uh, in the mainstream journals of the so SACP, of the ANC, um, I got published far much earlier. Mm -hmm. I think when I was in my teen years, like uh, wow. got to be engaging with far much older political leaders in terms of uh, what happened. And and then the uh, when I was in the working full time in the uh, SACP, then the ANC clique leaders that time it was the Zagalala and Balula like as wow. SG and president. Yeah, yeah. Then they kept on saying that come and work for the ANC clique and be full time because they've got progressive ideas. I said I won't go to the ANC clique because. I think you represent a neoliberal program and agenda yeah. <laughs> in terms of uh, what got to happen. But what decidedly changed my mind about the ANC clique and participating like in its leadership structures was mm. the 2007 policy conference of the ANC towards mm. the Pulukwani 2007 conference, right. which elected uh, former President Zuma, uh, mm. which removed President Meki as the president of the ANC, although he was contesting for the third term. Mm. So in that policy conference, like I had first to brief the leadership of the SACP and of COSAT as to what should be the left policy perspectives that we must pursue, one in the policy conference, but two in the 53rd, uh, 52nd National Conference of the ANC in Pulukwane. So mm -hmm. like to say, no, this is a left agenda that we must pursue, mm -hmm. a, like a radical program. But there was actually no interest from the point of view of the uh, SACP and COSADU leadership, which are considered to be on the left of the ANC. Sure. And then in the policy conference, the ANC clique delegation was actually on the left of the ANC and then on the left of COSATU and the wow. SACP in terms mm -hmm. of the policy positions that they were in pursuit of. Sure. I remember the major discussion in that policy conference was what do we characterize as the primary enemy of the National Democratic Revolution? Mm -hmm. And then we, as the younger activists, were saying it's white monopoly capital. Mm -hmm. So then the major discussions in all the commissions was is white monopoly capital the enemy of the National Democratic Revolution? Mm. And, and coincidentally, again, I was with the president of the EFF now, Julius Malema, in the same commission. Right. We were arguing that you can't even ask the question of whether white monopoly capital is the enemy of the National Democratic Revolution. But also there was pursuit of the policy agenda on provision of a fee-free education until a higher education level. Mm. And then there was a discourse uh, around uh, building a state-owned pharmaceutical company. So you and were of uh, Yes. So yeah. most of those positions mm -hmm. gained traction. But what changed my mind and perspective about the organizational structures that could play a much more meaningful role, yeah. I thought that the ANC clique was now playing a much more central left role than the Communist Party and uh, mm -hmm. and COSADU in terms of um, mm -hmm. what they got to happen. But I still said that I can't go to the ANC clique because I'm still a young person, relatively, that time. I mean, like, 2007, I'm 24. Hmm. And then um, in 2008, I was then elected to the National Executive Committee of uh, the ANC Youth League. Right. And then the, I was then assigned to perform a lot of functions in the National Executive Committee of the ANC clique. So I was head of political education, policy, research. I was head of the president's office. And I was head of communications and the national spokesperson as well. Ah, interesting. So I was given a lot of perspectives in terms of, so I had to play the role of policy formulation sure. and still be able to articulate that in public and write a lot of perspectives mm. and still conduct political education in terms of what happened. Interact with the yeah, president. Yeah, in terms of, in terms of uh, what happened. And also like get to guarantee the ideological consistency of the ANC, which lacked before we got to Lutula House to then deal with the politics. And I must say that the transition from uh, the from Koza to House to Lutula House was a very tense one because uh, when I got elected, they realized that I'm drifting towards the ANC clique in terms of like policy positions yeah. and saying that this is a structure which we can carry a revolution through. Then the 
the general secretaries of Kosatu and the SACP. Mm. So this was Ravi and, and Blade and Zimande. Zimande at the time. Yeah. And then Gwede Mantashi was secretary general of, uh, but also he was in the national, in the, in the central committee of the SACP. Then they said, I must go and become the acting director of the Krisan Institute. So, ah, okay. So they so were then trying they, to then they, uh, they increased Bezalera, I think, fourfold. Oh, there something. we go. Hey. Yeah. So <laughs> would, they, would they view that, uh, no, I must not leave Kazatu yeah. House and everything else. Then I, I decided that the youth league says mm. I must full, be full-time. Mm. And the Christian Institute says I must be full-time. Yeah. They called all sorts of people to try to persuade me. And then I decided mm. to leave Kosatu House and be based, be based in a Lutil House as a, yeah. those functions, political education, policy, research, head of presidency, and a national spokesperson as mm. well of uh, the ANC, which didn't mean anything for me because because they had, they had, you had to reduce the salary, which was like acting executive director of Chris Honey Institute to now be at the Lutula House, which did not have a far much more structured support for. And and the, the, the manner in which uh, we got to uh, play a role in the youth league was uh, then, then safeguarded the yeah. ideological consistency and coherence of uh, the ANC clique. And is that where and, your personal and, and, relationship yeah, so, and then kind the, of your your personal relationship with the current president of the EFF was it in that creation of that ideological vision? Yes, that, yeah, it, um, it happened. So actually, before the ANC clique joined the third national congress, which elected us into the national executive committee. Yeah. So I was requested by uh, that National Executive Committee of Mbalula and Sihle mm. mm. to be at the core of the Drafting and Resolutions Committee right. of the Congress. Right. So <clears throat> I done the discussion documents towards the 23rd mm. National Congress and was ultimately responsible for consolidation of all the Congress outcomes mm. in terms of that is way we got to articulate the much more mm. radical policy perspectives on nationalization of mines, on expropriation of land without compensation. And we're able to mainstream that into public discourse mm. in a way that got to define uh, how we move forward. Yeah. What do you think has been behind the longevity of your political relationship? And what lessons have you learned from Julius Malema, things maybe we don't get to see that only you would have seen. Um, what's behind actually building this thing that's now lasted 10 years that everyone said would would fade or would be a write-off, but, but actually has had staying power despite many attempts to destroy it, attack it, discredit it. What kind of personal lessons have, have you learned that maybe we wouldn't have seen? Oh, yeah. So what, what actually defines the president of the EFF now is the fact that he does not uh, surrender political principle on the altar of political convenience. He is very consistent. Once the position is taken, he sticks to that position. It doesn't matter who says what. It doesn't matter who tries to lobby him on the side. On policy positions, mm. he's very consistent. So you can actually check, even prior to him being in the mainstream leadership of the ANC, the people that he got to associate with, the people that he believed in, his demand for free, free education and led huge protests here in Johannesburg on behalf of courses that time on free education, on a variety of progressive policy positions. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he does not tiptoe around elders on the basis that, no, we must just worship, praise the mm -hmm. elder political leaders. He speaks with consistency, with clarity on policy positions. Yeah. And that is what should define all leaders in terms of what is expected. And, uh, and that is what I think got to maintain this political relationship that has got to mm -hmm. define uh, my relationship with the president of the EFF is because he's very consistent, he's dependable, and he, he, he takes his work very seriously. Yeah. He doesn't disappear in terms of uh, what is expected from him in terms of him, but also he, in an excellent uh, way, 
relates with uh, ordinary people on the ground. And uh, tell me about you and your upbringing, because many people know about your rise to the political scene, but I believe, and I know I've read a few articles, but it's 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 often not clear that that you came from very difficult circumstances. Uh, tell us about growing up and what life was like for you then. Yeah, look, the I, I, I rarely do profile interviews that speak about myself, but I can yeah. talk about that now. That yeah. then, so I grew up in a village called Mawonezi Village in Malamlele. It's called Collins Chabana Municipality now. Like. Uh, in a place which, like a village which didn't have access to so many basic things. So the water will come intermittently, intermittently in terms of what happens. It was not dependable water supply, but from a common water tap where you had to push a wheelbarrow, fill in a 25 liter and push the wheelbarrow back. And then there was definitely no electricity like uh, in the spaces that, uh, in the village which I grew up in, Actually, electricity was only installed in 2010 or 2011 in the village where I came from. So I, like the, were very far from modernity in terms of uh, what happened and what was expected of us, like all the village uh, young children, was to look after goats and uh, and to look after cattle. You know, yesterday I saw a six-year-old child. like, And then I remember that when I was six, we were expected to go very far, barefooted to look for goats and cattle. But the way I, I looked at a six-year-old, I was like, but we were that young. But the kind of work which was expected of us was uh, we were much more uh, difficult. And then um, went to primary school uh, in the village and then went to high school. How did you make and it to same. Vitz? How did you make it to Vitz from from those circumstances? So, and what was that journey like? Yeah. So the um, so throughout my high school years, I like I used to apply to different universities, like to say I, I want to study. Initially, I wanted to study medicine wow. in terms of uh, what my career aspirations were. But then I let on change my mind that I don't think I'll be suitable for medicine then. I then decided that I'm going to study uh, engineering. And then, so I applied for Vets University. And then one of the people who had been exposed to higher education from the village, they said to me, if you want to study engineering, you must study in a technicon instead of a university. Then I applied the uh, for engineering, civil engineering at the, for Vets Technicon. And then I went to write a selection test and I was accepted for civil engineering uh, at Vets Technicon. But I still had this aspiration, like, because throughout my life was that I want to study at Vets University because I had seen the prospectors. It looked much more exciting yeah. in terms of what happened. Then um, I I had to accompany my cousin brother, uh, Musa Shubham, to go to Vets University because he couldn't get space at Vets Technicon. Then when we got to Vets University, I was like, I think this is where I must study. It doesn't matter what I'm studying. Then I spoke to one of the consultants, they like who were assisting the student assistants. And then I said, here are my metric results. What can you accept me for? Uh, can I study engineering? They said, no, engineering is full now, uh, but you can study law. And then if you don't want to study law only, you can mix other social sciences. And I, I was hearing the first time that day that there's something called social sciences. And then they said sociology. I was hearing for the first time that the, the word sociology was hearing for the first time in my life. And then uh, they said international relations. I was like, so someone can study international relations and then you can study political studies. I never knew that someone can study political studies. And I said, that is what I'm going to study. So I did BA law. So I had some law degrees and then I registered for sociology, international relations and political studies. And I uh, had to learn very fast, like uh, in a, because I'd never been exposed to that discourse. 
And the other thing, which I, I think I spoke about it before, was because uh, I never gained access to a library for the entirety of my life. Like, hmm. I never used the computer for the entirety of my life. Hmm. Like, uh, hmm. So at Vits, that is when I got to touch, not even use, touch for the first wow. time a computer. Wow. It is the first time I entered the library. So I used to say that when I go to university, I'm going to read all those library books. Every there, single one. Everything. <laughs> when I went to what in Wheeler a library, mm. place, I realized that there's actually a yeah. lot of books. That would take quite a long time. <laughs> then I then got to realize that I have to mainstream to read what is relevant. Yeah. But I got to... And, uh, and then got to... And actually, one other thing which got to happen is that in my first day at VITS, like, I went to the audition teaching. Well, I got the uh, the first application, which was accepted, mm -hmm. that I can study the BA law. And then I went to the orientation, tab orientation table. Mm -hmm. And then they, I see people are joining organizations. I knew from high school that I'm going to join uh, SASCO. Interesting. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, and then I went to ask, where is SASCO? And then some guy who, uh, who was part of one of uh, the social sciences schools council mm -hmm. said to me, no, these people of SASCO are too corrupt, man, and SASCO is not existing yet, Vets, it's not suitable for Vets University. They've got confused ideology. And then I was hearing the word ideology for the first time as well, <laughs> in terms of uh, what we got to say. Then I was like, but that, that, that can't be. Yeah. And then, then, then so in my first day, I couldn't join SASCO because SASCO was not them. And then later on, in the around March, we then got together with some of the students there. We then constituted the SASCO branch, like out of the pieces of some of the activists that were there. So in my first year, I became the branch secretary of SASCO. And then in my second year, I was branch chairperson. And then in my third year, I was SRC president. Uh, wow. At, at, at Vits. But the what got to define the whole thing is that from not knowing about the social sciences yeah. and political studies, by the end of my first year, 2002, I was very coherent. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, by my second year, I was now even writing discussion documents for SASCO National Congresses. Mm -hmm on the ideological character of SASCO and a very coherent one. Even when I read that in posterity now, yeah. it still makes sense what, uh, it's something which you can still own up to, that this is what I got to um, to write about. So I got to develop far much faster in terms of the ideological uh, understanding and uh, appreciation of what uh, got to happen. and. Um, that is what got to happen and we played our role in student politics and activism and that, and that is how we got to to move. The but rest, we come from a, the, the rest is history. Yeah, the rest the is rest history. The rest we know. But yeah. that, that story yeah. is really interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that because yeah. it's, uh, it's a fascinating story. Um, and we often don't know the people behind politics. We know what they say in public. Yeah. But uh, I think the way your story informs your political uh, direction is, is very yeah. clear. And from where you, you know, come from. The, the other thing which the, defined my, my political life when I was a student activist is that so this is, so I go to, I don't have funding for the universities. I go to the financial aid office, mm. right? Then the, then they say, okay. Where do you come from? So I say, I'm from my own is a village. What is the street name? I said, there's no street names in villages. Mm. And then some lady says, what do you mean there's no street name? What kind of madness is that? Mm. And I'm like, there's no street mm. names. Mm. Okay, what is your house number? I said, there are no house numbers in villages. Mm. Then she says, no, move, 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 move. I'll come to attend to you only once you have got an address. Sure. Then my brother was staying in Deep Loof where uh, in a backyard shack, shack like mm. Uh, mm. so I then had to take the address of the area where he was staying mm. to submit to then they said no because you are staying in deep roof we can't give you residence at this you must be a traveling student sure. so for my first year and second year I was a traveling student so I yeah. was staying in a backyard shack with my brother hmm. 
and then I will take a taxi to vet every day. And how would you start? Like, so you studied. It was. Um, you, you became. You became a leading voice in the student movement. So yes. you were studying in that backroom shack. Yes. Every night. And then still learning there. how to use a computer mm. and all of those things. That because that year must have been. Yeah, it could have been, It was a very difficult year. Yeah. Mm, because. Hey, we're like typing an assignment with what <laughs> And then sometimes you get stuck on the on the on the computer keyboard looking mm. for a word a queue there. You mm. don't find it. You look <laughs> several times. And then you yeah. end up asking someone else to do that. Why is Q here? Yeah. They just click quickly. Sure. Because they are used to it themselves. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. that is how it was. But then because of the circumstances that uh, define us and 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 the financial aid system was very difficult at the time because they never used to allow us access to the dining hall. Mm. So they used to give us an allowance of 325 rand for three months. Three months? Yes. That was for sure. advice, for books, for food, for everything else that mm. you needed. Mm. Mm. And that time you were a traveling student. And so before Mandela Bridge, you know the distance from North the takes a rank to Vez University mm. every day and then later on come back and uh, <laughs> you know what the incident some some guys uh, stopped me and then took a gun out on me mm. and said give us money I said I don't have money I've got to run 50 to go home then wow. they say okay that's fine you can go <laughs> but tomorrow you must bring our money wow wow uh, so, and that is what, that is the, those are the old deals which students were subjected to. Yeah, yeah. So my voice for, to demand student accommodation and for better funding models was much more relevant and much more strong mm. in terms of, because it affected me directly yeah. as well in terms of, so that is the, it was a very difficult period, but we got to survive. I only got to be staying in residence when I was SRC president. Hmm. What do you think of the Youth League now, having served it, having set that ideological trajectory? It has obviously gone through a period of not being constituted at all, and now it claims to be back. What are your thoughts on the current situation in the Youth League? Look, I, I, don't, I'm, I'm, I don't detect any coherence from the ANC Youth League now or any cogent program that is coming. Well, they say economic freedom in our lifetime, which I think is a commendable thing to could look into. What do you say because about the EFF stole the youth league? So this is, so do you know, this is, we, we conceptualize the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. So towards the 24th Congress of the ANC League, we got to consolidate all the progressive policy positions. And of course said then that we are not inventors of the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. We then said, let's go back to check of the generations of uh, the struggle against colonialism and apartheid. Who do we draw most inspiration from? And then we purposefully drew inspiration from the founding generation of the Congress Youth League of A.P. Dow, of Robert Subupe, of Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Lembede. Congress Mbata, mm -hmm. Anton Lembede. Mm -hmm. And their generational mission, they called it freedom in our lifetime. And, and they developed a program uh, which got to radicalize the ANC mm -hmm. in a very decisive and significant way. Uh, the, the program of action of 1948 of the Congress Youth League, which got to become the program of action of the ANC 1949 Congress, which elected uh, Walter Sisulu as a Secretary General of the ANC and uh, James Morocco as president, although he had just joined uh, that time. Then we say that learning from that generation of freedom in our lifetime, we should now have a, a generational mission of economic freedom in our lifetime. It must have its own pillars and articulation in terms of what we stand for. So we, we do not claim to have invented any struggle. Then towards the 24th Congress of the ANC League, uh, I was as head of political education, policy, research. I was then mandated to draft that program of action. 
Then we, we then drafted a, a document which was called the Clarion Call Towards Economic Freedom Fighters, a program of action for economic freedom in our lifetime. And and the, I pick up that the, these ones who are in the youth league now, they have not picked up that. So we put in that program of action of the ANC youth league, the seven cardinal pillars. They are not identical to the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF. Interesting. Yeah, so it's... Yeah. So the common ones will be nationalization of mines and the land expropriation without compensation and the provision of fee-free education. But the other components are, are different in terms of how we got to articulate that. So then that program of economic freedom in our lifetime, which we said is a generational mission, gained traction and then we got to mobilize all sectors of society. So our ANC clique, was not just the ANC League of mobilizing young people behind the banner of the ANC and mm. championing their interests. Mm. We were involved in community and worker struggles, several of them. We were involved in the mines and we were joining up to mine workers' demands for better wages. We were, we're, demand, we're joining into the ordinary struggles of ordinary people everywhere. We then say this program should be a program that uh, defines everyone else. You must go and listen or, or read the ANC League president that time, uh, President Julius Belli must report to the 24th National Congress. We actually went to the extent of saying that in the absence of vanguard of the working class, the ANC League is going to be the vanguard of the working class mm -hmm. and say that we are at the forefront of these struggles. And we were acutely aware that the economic freedom struggle and economic freedom agenda far exceeded the organizational borders of Congress movement structures, sure. where gained it in communities and everything else. That is why when uh, the expulsions and suspensions happened, yeah. we then asked the question, what do we do with this struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime, which had gained traction even beyond the organizational borders of the Congress movement? Do we, do we stand back and hope that it will be revived within the Congress movement? Those are the questions that we asked by the way towards the formation of the EFA. Yeah. Or do we just form an NGO which will just advocate for economic freedom in our lifetime or form a political party to uh, uh, pursue this agenda? And then the decision was to form the EFF as an organizational expression of the agenda for economic freedom in our lifetime. And with an appreciation that there will still be remnants of economic freedom in our lifetime within the Congress movement. Mm -hmm. But my characterization of the suspensions and the expulsion was an attempt to abort the whole economic freedom in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. So if you check the immediate conference that came after we left, uh, we yeah. were expelled from the ANC. That's 2012. Got, yeah, 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Got to over 10, <clears throat> even decisions of the National General Council of the ANC. Because the extent of influence which we had over ANC structures was unparalleled, was unprecedented in a huge way. We had so we, we, our rallying point at that time was on nationalization of mines, on land expropriation without compensation. We went to the NGC of the ANC yeah. in uh, 20, 10, I think. 2010, yeah. yes. Yeah, I remember in that. 2010. Yeah. And then, do you know, all structures, all branches of the ANC, like all provinces, all alliance partners, were overwhelmingly behind the ANC clicks agenda. Like, and for the first time in an ANC meeting, you had more than 80% of the National General Council attending the Economic Transformation Commission, mm -hmm. which never was the case before. So in previous conferences of the ANC, the Economic Transformation Commission will be attended by elite few, mm -hmm. like it will never have more than 30 people. But in that National General Council, 80% of uh, the NGC was in one commission to discuss nationalization of mines. So if you read the ANC, uh, NGC resolution, it actually says there was overwhelming consensus on nationalization of mines in terms of uh, what got to happen. And I was part of the drafting and resolutions committee of that NGC as well. Then they tried to change the resolution 
from commission to plenary. Then we had to fight for it to be presented in plenary. And still they tried to change it. We had to approach the stage physically mm. and to, to say that you cannot change the resolution. And this happens when in the media interviews outside, Trevor Manuel, Pravin Godan, and all these liberals in the ANC were assuring the global capitalist markets that there will never be a resolution on nationalization of mines. But we took that resolution through an overwhelming consensus. Mm. And that is when uh, these old people said that this youth league has gained so much ideological influence. They needed to be... Yeah, they had to cut that off in terms of uh, what, uh, what happened. And the influence, by the way, was not only in the big meetings of uh, the ANC, like conferences and general councils, even in the Tula House. Like I used to sit in the Economic Transformation uh, Committee, mm -hmm of the ANC, which was chaired by Max Sussou. Okay. And, and almost all the time, we'll uh, emerge victorious in terms of perspective. Mm -hmm. So superior logic always prevailed and would give proper reference that. But the Freedom Charter says that the mineral wealth beneath the soil, the banks and monopoly industry shall be transferred to the ownership of the people as a whole. What is your reference if you are refusing nationalization of mines? Like, on what basis? And and we'll say that the Freedom Charter says even in the membership form of the ANC, it says that I, 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 I proclaim to abide by the constitution, the policies, and the Freedom Charter aspirations. Why, when you have signed to say you are going to defend the Freedom Charter, now you want to change it? So they will always win the argument and, uh, and will boldly uh, say that this is what happens. And something which I got to realize as well within ANC structures, on many instances, when you have defeated these old people with yeah. ideological persuasion, sure. they say, no, but we cannot do this because they won't agree. Hmm. And then they say, who, who, who's they? Yeah. Then they say, ah, we can't tell. They won't agree. Sure. They won't agree. Like, you know, Godongwan used to do that. So you would actually hear that from <laughs> yes. senior NCAA. Yeah, you know, Godongwan would say, no, they won't agree. Hmm. And uh, Susan Shabango, when she was Minister of Mineral yeah. Resources, no, they won't agree. Sure. They won't agree. Like, uh, so there's some very. Uh, yeah, there is. And then you say, but what the ANC, yeah. now what the ruling party was supposed to take decisions. Yeah. Now, who is they? Yeah. Is there another, another structure elsewhere? Yeah. So they would always say uh, those things. And one of the things which, by the way, we used to do um, as we, we used to isolate the ANC leaders and persuade them that, that mm. this is the perspective. So we'd go and meet Kosatu and meet the SACP and I, even I'd isolate individual leaders to um, speak to them about what we stand for. I remember in one of the engagements, I think it was this annual uh, beginning of the early quarter of the ANC. Mm. So I spoke to Sarah Ramaphosa. He was mm. not the deputy president at that time of the ANC. He okay. was just an ordinary national executive member. Yeah, sure, sure. Then I say, no, this thing of nationalization of mines is the only way to go, and these are the reasons. It will give us some economic sovereignty. We had like seven reasons on why we must nationalize the mines. It will expand the revenue base yeah. so that we can be, it will give us space for industrialization. I'm so interested to hear what his, <laughs> what his response was. Then uh, <laughs> he then said, uh, no, well, I can hear what you're saying and it makes sense, but a takey cannot vote for Christmas. That is what he said. Hmm that takeys can't vote for Christmas. He mm -hmm. says that I'm the takey, I own the mines, why would I agree mm -hmm. to vote for a situation which is going to take these mines away from me? So, you know, like in, in the traditional Western culture, yeah. takey is the primary yeah. uh, food item on Christmas day. Then yeah. he says, no, a takey cannot vote for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote an article about that to say, Sarah Ramaphosa is the ticket who cannot vote for Christmas and Buffalo, characterize how. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, and the. So can the, I ask you, by the way, just on that, because you've known obviously Cyril Ramaphosa for a long time as a leader in the ANC. 
And since we're on that, just that subject, how long do you think he will survive as president of the ANC? Look, the, I think the, the ANC dynamics will be drastically affected by the electoral outcomes of the 2024 general elections because the ANC is definitely going to lose political power, like outright political control. You're sure about that? Yeah, you think I'm they're going to go below 50? Sure. Yes, yeah. They are going to be below 50. Where do you think? Yeah. Even 40% will be very difficult. Hmm. There is nothing which... Um, because definitely how thing is gone from the ANC is control. Sure, sure. Yeah, that goes without saying. Kwazu Natal is definitely gone. I'm deployed in Kwazu Natal mm. like, uh, for, towards elections. It's definitely gone from the control mm. of the ANC. Western Cape is already mm. out. Uh, Northern Cape is going to be out. Free State will be out. Mm. Uh, if, if our structures of the EFF are much more alert and much more consistent, the the ANC can be taken out as well in Pumalanga because there is no really strong and credible ANC leaders in that province. Same in Limpopo. There is huge uh, traction which the EFF is gaining, but also ANC structures are weaker. There is no seasoned organizers. When most of the people who are leading the ANC structures, including in the Eastern Cape, it's people that we led them in the ANC youth league, like uh, in the Eastern Cape is Oscar Mabuyane, like when he was a deputy chairperson of the ANC youth league, we were in the National Executive Committee, mm -hmm. we went to conduct the induction. Same with Kwazulu Natal, Duma is the chair of the province of the ANC, Mdolo is a, a secretary of the province. They were part of the youth league which we led. Mm -hmm. We actually presided over the conference which elected them. And we know their individual and collective weaknesses. So, so you, there is no way that they can they can uh, uh, overturn the misfortune, the long overdue collapse electorally of the ANC. And the ANC doesn't have the history and the capacity to recover from electoral losses. Go and check how they've been in constant and perpetual decline in the Western Cape. There's no prospect that it will ever come back. So you think after 2024, once the election result goes sour for the ANC, that President Ramaphosa's position is going to be... Yes, it will have huge impact because this is what is going to happen. We have been saying as the EFF that an ideal situation is that when the ANC goes below 50%, all opposition parties, irrespective of ideological positions mm -hmm. and dispositions, sure. should unite to take the ANC out of power completely. Mm -hmm. So we must unplug them from power like completely everywhere and recall all the ambassadors, everything, mm -hmm. and remove all their appointments, we must unplug them from power on every aspect of society. Mm -hmm. So they feel the full and effect, take yeah. Yeah, remove their even police commissioners <laughs> and army generals we remove everything. We must properly surgically remove them from power. That is what we should do as opposition parties. But there seem to be a different agenda that is emerging and coordinated by the Oppenheimers that seeks to isolate the EFF mm -hmm. as an enemy force or as a force that must be isolated and not be interacted with. What do you make of that? In because of, uh, John Steenhuisen says you're enemy number one, not the ANC. And, and then suddenly this idea of removing the ANC now becomes more difficult because you are now identified as being part of the ANC. Yeah, so do you know... The, the DA is articulating the positions of uh, of Brand Test Institute of the Oppenheimers. And the Oppenheimers always plan political transitions in South Africa. From the from the beginning, like that core of Anglo American and all of those, they've they've always played the central role in terms of change of political power. Like they played their central role. Also in the transition from uh, uh, apartheid to democracy, I wrote a, a, a master's thesis mm -hmm. about that at Edwards University on how the open Oppenheimers were at the center of that transition, particularly in terms of its a, a economic uh, 
agenda and content. I mean, like, I, I, I interviewed very senior people from the Oppenheimer Circle, like Bobby Godsell and uh, Clem Santa, who was the one main a person in the office of Harry Oppenheimer. And then they explained that we decided that, that apartheid must go and then we continue to do business as usual. So that is what they do. So what the Oppenheimers are currently doing in South Africa, they realize the might and the power of the EFF and its potential moving forward. And they have no access to the EFF. They realize the power that we had and when we put the issue of expropriation of land without uh, uh, composition, expropriation of property without composition, which we almost uh, found uh, agreement on the uh, with the ANC on, then they realized that the only force that threatens their existence is the EFF. Hence, they formed Action SA. They fund uh, the DA perpetual. Go and check the political party funding declarations. They don't even fund Action SA and DA through some proxy structures. They put it themselves. Like, they donate directly millions of uh, rands. I'm, I'm sure Action SA has received upward of 60 million rands now from the Oppenheimers and their related structures. The DA is funded heavily from that. They even determine the agenda of what should happen. I mean, like, I'll tell you that after the 2021 local government elections, I said with uh, Hemen Mashaba and uh, the Action SA leaders, like, all of them, like, there was no, there was no any authority above them. Yeah. And then we agreed on a framework of how we're going to constitute the government in the city of Johannesburg and Tswane sure. and Ekorule. But later on, the Action SA issued a statement around three o'clock in the morning like the early hours to denounce what we agreed with them. Yeah, yeah. Like you realize that if we did actually say these days, we we'll mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. you cannot associate with these people. And and that is what happens. Like they are not, they don't have an independent organization. Yeah. Unlike in the EFF, once you come to the EFF, you meet with the leadership and there's an agreement. It's final. There is no one who is going to change the decisions of the EFF. Once we agree as the collective, that this is what we're going to do, we do exactly that. So all our commitments are reality. It's, we're not, we're, there's no one who controls this organization outside of its elected leaders. But these other ones are puppets. And the open Amas are correctly concerned about the rise of the EFF because when we take power, we're going to reverse their dominance. We're going to reclaim the land. We're going to reclaim the mineral resources we're going to redistribute South Africa's economy in a way that is going to empower all uh, the people of South Africa, not just a small few of white capitalists who have been in dominance for a very long time now. Yes, yeah, so we were just talking about the election and what effect that might have on President Ramaphosa's future. Yeah, look, so I was giving that background that we, our first option is that all opposition parties must consolidate an agenda to remove the ANC from power. And if that does not happen, we have decided as the EFF that we are going to start participating in national government next year. We mm. are ready to form part of government. Mm. And if the only option to constitute government will have to talk with the ANC or to the ANC, yeah. one of the non-negotiable conditionalities is that we can't have Sarah Ramaphosa as the president of mm. South Africa. So that's so going to be like, one of your conditions. And if the ANC is going to take the attitude of Sarah Ramaphosa or nothing. They're going to get nothing. That is what is going to happen. It's as simple as that. Because Sarah Ramaphosa historically and currently is an agent of white monopoly capital. He's an agent that was utilized to infiltrate the liberation movement for selfish purposes. He has been controlled for the rest of his life by the Oppenheimers, they funded his education, they funded his first house. Everything else that is him is centered around the control of the Oppenheimers. He has got too much faith in the dominance of white monopoly capital. And that is at the center of the sufferings of our people, the, the economic exclusion 
of our people. So Sarah Ramaphosa must go as soon as yesterday. So if the ANC, or when the ANC is out of power, and then the DA continues with its arrogance, the only conditionality that we will ever discuss and have any discussion with the uh, ANC is when Sarah Ramaphosa is not there. We did that, by the way, before with uh, the situation of former President Zuma. We met with the ANC after the 2016 uh, local government elections. Yeah. And then we say to the ANC that President Zuma must step down. Then they say it's Zuma or nothing in the municipalities. And then we took them out decisively. In Nelson Mandela Bay, in Tswane, in the city of Johannesburg, in Tabazimbi, in Mudumulu Mohopo, in Mitsimaholu, in many critical municipalities which historically they used to control. So if the ANC is going to take an arrogant approach uh, after the 2024 general elections, they must know that they're going to get nothing. If they come to us with the attitude that they want Ramaphosa or nothing, they will get absolutely nothing. That's incredible because th that changes the whole way that the conversation around that election is going to go because it's, it's not just a question of is it the ANC and the EFF or is it an opposition coalition, but it's who actually is going to be leading the ANC coming out of that? So that, that, that obviously will be in, in due consideration. Mm -hmm. Our first prize mm -hmm. is to unplug the ANC completely out of power. And we know that the manner in which the organization ANC is built now, it's so dependent on government. So once we unplug them off government, they lose organizational relevance as well because they utilize state resources for political campaigns. And so once you unplug them from a, a, a government, they, they will dwindle into permanent insignificance. That we are 100% sure that once you unplug them from, because look, our path to power is simple. And I think we had predicted, predicted this at the formative stages. So in one of the private emails and interactions when we started the EFF, our prediction was that first elections will get a million votes, second elections will get two million votes when we're stabilizing the presence of the organization everywhere. And we all, all already knew that we're going to start to, to gradually participate at local government level. Sure. Third elections, which is 2024, we're going to get four million and upward of four million votes. And then the, the fourth elections, it's an outright victory of the economic emancipation movement. And, and the prospects are there. We got 1.1 million votes, and because of some technical issues, in uh, 2019, we got 1.8 million votes in South Africa. We easily could have received the 2 million, which we, we deserved in terms of the dynamics. And we're now on the path of the 4 million plus votes, if not more, which will mean that there won't be an outright winner of elections. And 2029, we're going to have the outright majority uh, and victory in South Africa way. And we appreciate, by the way, that the path to power will sometimes constitute some of the tactical retreats and compromises, which otherwise will not compromise the seven cardinal pillars, which will not compromise what we stand for, the foundational principles of the EFF. But we will, uh, we will participate in government uh, from 2024 moving forward so that by the time we take over government in 2029 with an outright a decisive majority mm -hmm. we have gained the necessary experience of being national government in the same way we are uh, gaining the experience now at local government level uh, through our participation in governments of the city of Johannesburg of Ekorulini of Etequin, of Nelson Mandela Bay, of Mukhali City Local Municipality, of the Western District, and a variety of municipalities in the Free State and in the Northwest as well, where uh, our councillors have been assigned the government responsibilities. How do you reflect on the EFF's time, albeit short, in local government, in government, and what have you learned from actually now going into govern various parts of different municipalities? Look, we, we have gone into now government participation in a, the obvious limitation of government. It's, it's bureaucratization, like the bureaucracy 
limits its agility to respond to service delivery needs. Mm. We are going to start eradicating the bucket toilets in Ekorulin, for instance. But to get to that, you need to go through a very long bureaucratic process of budgeting, of request for proposals and adjudication and all of those other things that something which is logical. There are people who have got solutions to provide flushing toilets even at a small scale level without having to put it into a sewerage grid. You can be able to have flushing toilet outside of a sewerage grid. You can put septic tanks. It's in the manifesto of the EFF that we can't plug a, a flushing toilets into a sewerage grid or into this a, a sanitation grid of a, of municipalities. Mm -hmm. Let's use septic tanks and in a way that is sustainable because the chemical and bucket toilets are so dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. It's so dehumanizing. They, they've got some trucks which they call honey suckers which go and collect. And, and then in the process of collecting from those bucket toilets, they spread everything else on the streets of mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, <laughs> it's not bearable. And we can't be as EFF in government and responsible for water and sanitation and we can't resolve that immediately. But the manner in which now the laws are designed, we're forced to go through that long process because if you do anything else, they'll say it's corruption, it's maladministration and everything else. We need a different model of uh, <clears throat> increasing and enhancing local government's agility. Mm -hmm to respond to agent service delivery matters. So if it means we shorten the period of uh, getting certain things responded to quicker, we should be able to do so. Like, uh, do you know, we had a situation in Kwaten, in um, Ekorulin, where some people sabotaged, sabotaged a, a substation of electricity. Sure. And you are, you are not permitted to just enter and immediately restore it into functionality. Mm -hmm. You must go through a procurement process and identify people who must. So local government in its current design is not agile in terms of uh, what happens. But the bigger problems of local government uh, coming as far as uh, the perennial non-functionality of municipalities in rural areas. So whoever designed South Africa's local government's framework moved from the premise that all municipalities have got the capacity or must have the capacity to collect the revenue from their own citizens. But the majority of our areas are so poor, there's no revenue base that you can collect uh, resources from. So majority of our municipalities are dysfunctional. Majority of them utilize more than 80% of their budget on salaries and just basic administration. And are unable to respond to the to the needs of uh, of our people. So th those are some of the things that we're observing in terms of uh, how we're handling uh, most of these issues. And the and the other thing which also we get to observe is that the is an emerging tendency of administrators. Uh, declaring coup d'etats in municipalities, mm. where administrators are more powerful than the political leadership. Mm. So you find a municipal manager who commands councillors what to do. Mm. And it's supposed to be the other way around that. The municipal managers are appointed by a council, must account to council. But you've got municipal managers and heads of departments who, who, who preside over councillors are more powerful than the councillors. Mm. Either because they've given them bribe money somewhere in the corner and then the, the, those councillors no longer have power to could preside over them. Mm. Municipalities are hijacked by administrators, a lot of them. A lot of, so you've got super powerful municipal managers who account to no one. And you've got super powerful HODs who account to no one because they've captured and uh, have subjugated uh, these, these councillors to their control. Mm -hmm. and, and it looks like the other political parties have allowed that to happen. In the EFF, we intimately monitor what 
becomes the conduct of our counselors. And, and uh, when we realize that they are fearful of administrators, we, we then step in to say, you can't be fearful of administrators. You are supposed to give strategic political guidance in terms of what happens. And it's one of the issues that must have to look into where administrators have literally declared coup d'etat over the political leadership. What do you think your experience in coalition government, in local government, has taught you about this post-2024 phase where you might actually go into a national coalition? And has it changed anything about what kind of demands you would make if you were to be brought into either an opposition or an ANC coalition government? Look, the uh, one thing which we have got to appreciate now with our participation in government is that when we are given a responsibility as the EFF, all other parties that are part of that government must permit the EFF to implement its policies the best way it sees how. And of course, in compliance with the existing laws, some of which we're going to propose must be changed so that local government is much more agile and it's able to respond quicker to the demands of the people. Yeah. But there must be autonomy of how we can we then get to respond to the uh, demands of the people. That is why if we were to replicate this uh, at national government level, um, it, it will be workable because there's an, it's a sensible argument that people are presenting that why in Houting, for instance, mm -hmm. the ANC gets 50% plus 50.1% 50 of the electoral support. But when it comes to government, we take everything. Mm -hmm. We're in control of all the resources and all the... Yeah. So you have got half of the population that is not represented in government, which has said that we do not want you to be government. And there's no expression on... A, I think we might need to look into that moving forward as to how do the interest of all people find expression in government? Because these oversight bodies are powerless, like um, whoever can say what, councils, legislatures, even parliament, We've seen that. they have got no say over what government does. They just come like go through a rigorous budgeting process and appropriation process in parliament. But the budget will be what they've decided from the beginning. You can't change anything. Like, uh, you, you can cry, you can do anything, you can be much more vigorous in terms of how you hold the executive to account. But once they've taken a decision, they have taken a decision. And on behalf of who? Like, because you got 50%. What about the other 50% who say they don't want you? That's interesting because do you think that some kind of government of national unity could be an option or, or like a bigger... You see, they are, so yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example that so in the municipalities, you have got an executive council uh, system, which for instance applies in the city of Etequin in, in KwaZulu-Natal. So that model is much more workable because the representation in the executive of the government of the municipality yeah. is determined by the electoral outcome. Sure, sure. So you see in Etequini, the ANC is number one, although it doesn't have the outright majority, it's less than 50%. Mm -hmm. Number two is the DA. The EFF is number three in Etequini. IFP is a distant number four mm -hmm. uh, in, in Etequini. And by virtue of us having received the uh, 24 out of the 122 councillors of Etiquin, we automatically qualify for an executive position. That is why we are participating in the government of Etiquin now, responsible for human settlement and infrastructure, because we were elected to. It's a much more reflective uh, government composition. Could you see in that terms at, the of national, power. at the national level? I, I would think that as part of, of um, moving forward, that must be of consideration. And, and of course, it's issues that we must have to look into. Sure. 
True. Not those things that you get this number and then you take all the power. Mm. To take Especially if you get less than even 50. And yes, you if you get less than 50, then you take, yeah, yeah. Then you, you take all the power. And yeah. uh, and uh, and maybe another discussion which maybe the other generations must have as well, it's yeah. this thing of uh, a super president. It will be very difficult mm. to have super president because the current constitution provides for a super president. Absolutely. And uh, I looked into that in, in my yeah. first book and I realized the South African president actually has more power than many dictators in yes. Eastern Europe, South America. Yes, like, like a, a president of the state. No, can, no, a president can go to war without consulting anyone by themselves. Like, uh, why can't we democratize? Like, how can you say one person can take a decision to go to war? There must be a system of... And then a president appoints a... Everyone, 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 including yeah. judges, and, mm -hmm. and 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 they know that they serve in those responsibilities mm -hmm. at his behest. They can suspend yeah. a head of the uh, the national prosecution authority mm -hmm. with no reason, yeah. like uh, appoints almost everything. That uh, it's it's one of the issues that they have to to be looked into. And I would think that that discussion in a in a area where there is no outright winner of elections will be the most relevant because how do you give the entire state to one human being when they never had the overwhelming majority to constitute government? You could even and have a situation they, where 30% voted for yes. that, that person's party. And then that person becomes like a, the, the manner in which yeah. it is. I'm sure that is part of the issues that must be looked into That's moving interesting. forward. That's interesting. Very interesting. It's one of the issues that must be looked into yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, like, what do you gain like as a political leader when you've got all these powers, majority of which you cannot use? What do you gain, like, really? Because if the ultimate purpose of participating in politics is about empowering our people, it's about stability, it's about security, why would you want to do that by yourself, all of that? Yeah. When you can open up the space to say, let these decisions be taken in a consultative way, in a, in a manner that is reflective of the whole of society. It's one of the discussions that must be looked into moving forward so that we, we even for future generations, we leave a governance system that is much more representative and is truly democratic in the manner that it is. The EFF is 10 years old. What has been your highest moment over the last 10 years, personally, within the EFF, and your lowest moment? Look, uh, there have been so many achievements that we got to uh, realize as the EFF. Um, we've been able to lead uh, a variety of discourse or discursive issues in parliament. Like we placed the issue of land at the center of South Africa and society's discussions on what should happen uh, in relation to that. I mean, like we brought to the fore the issue of um, the creation of a state-owned bank as well as part of our foundational policies. So. I sit in the Standing Committee on Finance. I've been since 2014. Mm -hmm. So we then introduced a private member's bill on uh, permitting the state, because the current Banks, Banks Act does not permit the state, was not permitting the state, was not permitting the state to own banks. Sure. Okay. Then we introduced the legislation to mm -hmm. do that. And the National Treasury, then they realized that there is overwhelming support of that. Then this, they then smuggled their own legislation called the Financial Matters Amendment Act, which then provided for space to create a state-owned bank. So it's one of the victories which tangibly yeah. we have gained. There's a legislative permissibility now to could create a state-owned bank in terms of uh, what happens. Even the discourse on fee-free education, we led that. Uh, and practically got to even uh, uh, position the EFF Student Command to be at the forefront of all uh, those uh, struggles. But also, we 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 are in the in the process now. We have actually introduced legislation on um, illicit financial flows and tax avoidance. And one of the things which most people in South Africa do not know is that. Whilst the ANC is neoliberal, it's selling out, and it's just doesn't have any progressive agenda. Part of 
what worsens that problem of the ANC as an instrument of government or of, of change, it's the semi-literacy of its public representatives. The, um, those uh, uh, people who are deployed by the ANC to parliament, including the ministers and, uh, and deputy ministers and members of parliament, they, they know nothing. Like they've got no appreciation of even South Africa. Like um, they've no knowledge of the economy of South Africa, of what what's constituted the uh, what constitute the economy of South Africa. I think um, I think Fanon deals with that in the Russia of the Earth that the national bourgeoisie and the national middle class that takes over power post the colonial rule. They've got no knowledge of the economy. They've got no clue of what is happening. So and so so some of the issues that we come with even on I mean like the leakages that come as a result of tax avoidance in South Africa go upward of 100 billion. You can achieve a lot with 100 billion, but you have got public representatives of the ruling party clueless yeah. about that phenomenon. The There's so many other issues like sure, the sure. and and the 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 levels of semi-literacy and goes to the extent that there is no foreseeable pos uh, possibility to could cure the ignorance levels. Even when you speak slowly and explain one by one that this is how things are. <laughs> so part of our problems in South Africa is the fact that we have got a, a, a huge number of um, semi-literate political leaders who get easily misled by... Uh, NGOs who get misled by uh, international uh, uh, organizations who get misled by foreign governments. I mean, like the energy policy of South Africa, for instance, it's out of semi-literacy, the manner in which we're pursuing it. There is no one who has yet proven that the electricity that is placed on the grid from solar or wind sources end up at the consumption level, at the destination. Because physics and those who are chemi who are chemistry uh, uh, doctorates and everything else, we actually sat with a group of chemistry and mm -hmm. physics doctorates who were saying that, show us where is this electricity that is coming from the sun in the Northern Cape. They say to us that solar as a basis, as an off-grid solution, yes, it can work to electrify your home, but as an on-grid solution, it doesn't arrive this because even when you generate electricity from uh, the coal power stations in uh, Matimba or Khrotfli, even when you pump in 5,000 megawatts into the grid, when it arrives at a destination, it can be 5,000. It, it, it wanes down as it moves on the high voltage grids. But we in South Africa now are being told we must put solar, but there's no one who shows where. What, what is the destination of this solar? We're paying billions of rents to uh, solar-generated electricity, and there is no one who has yet illustrated that it is arriving at destination. And of course, it's a discourse that must be looked into mm. moving forward. But uh, Can I ask you on that? We have to deal with that differently. Because um, I can't resist. Mbalula recently said he congratulated the Minister of Electricity for basically saving us from load shedding or drastically reducing it and said that Minister Gordon needed to speed up, otherwise he would be moved. The NC later walked that back through a statement. What do you think that says about the state of energy policy making and the political divisions behind that? No, look, the, you know one thing which most people do not know is, so you know, so Mbalula is in Lutula House. So Lutula House is not in charge of government. So, do you know, I worked in the two hours for five years, like, uh, and involved in the daily committees of the two hours. So those who are in the two hours, including the Secretary General of the ANC, receive information like all other people at the same time. Wow. The government operates very, very far out of it. They've no, there's no mechanism of the ruling party to guide policy, to guide the direction or to guide anything 
in terms of, they can take broad, uh, you can do a simple exercise. Like uh, they can go, can go to elections. I remember I was sitting in the communications committee of the ANC 2009. And then we went to elections with five priorities. We said five priorities of the ANC that time. Yeah. And then the first state of nation address after elections, uh, then President Zuma says that no government has got 10 priorities, which no, which were not the core of what we campaigned with. And then we said, but from a communications point of view, you're confusing us. Like as the communicators that time, what, why, why, uh, did they say, no, leave these things of the manifesto. Manifesto yeah. is something it's just else. something for elections. Yeah, it's for elections. Government is something else. So, so where do you so think the, policy is driven from, given your, your unique... Inside. So is it driven that, from government so maybe, or outside think, government? Yeah, so the, that diagnosis I gave of local government, they, they seem to be also um, a coup d'etat by uh, senior government administrators of just what happens in government. They've got no regard of politicians. I mean, I'll, I'll, the, when we were doing uh, the policy perspective on the creation of a state-owned bank, national treasury officials came to say, no, that will not happen. We are opposing. Until it had to be forced somewhere. We have got now in the Standing Committee on Finance a, a private member's bill on the nationalization of the South African Reserve Bank so that it joins more than 70% of central banks in the world which are not privately owned. Uh, and, and uh, the ANC in its last conference said that there must be nationalization of the Reserve Bank. But administrators of National Treasury comes to make presentation in Parliament that such will never happen. So these, uh, so government is on autopilot. It's, it's, run, it's not run by the, the current political leadership. There is no political direction that is given to... Uh, there are so many decisions that are just smuggled and everything else. There was an attempt now recently to take ESCOM out of the Public Finance Management Act processes, which was just going to increase the levels of corruption and looting that has been definitive of the utility. Yes. The ANC was not aware of that. Like majority of the people read about it in the newspapers. Like uh, there are so many decisions. Like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an example that when during the COVID period, yeah. there's a loan which National Treasury took from the IMF. Mm -hmm. I recall, yeah. Yes, the, uh, I think it was about 9 billion US dollars somewhere. So do you know the Deputy Minister of Finance, David Masondo, and strangely, even the DG, they came to say no, there will never be a loan that uh, will be taken from the IMF. The DG that time, Don Mohojan, he even came to address the caucus of the EFF to say, no, you know, IMF loans are only taken on when there is balance of payments difficulties. We don't have balance of payments difficulties, so there's no way we can take a loan from the IMF. And two days later, the National Treasury announced that we're taking a loan from the IMF. So it, it's perpetual like that on many aspects where government is running by itself and is taking all sorts of decisions without political direction. So even on this issue of energy policy, uh, there will always be contradictions because the Western agenda that is being enforced now is on um, uh, this renewable uh, energy approach, which scientifically has not yet given us the electricity that we need, and moving away from fossil fuels to West. the West is taking all the coal from uh, South Africa, and is not complying with their own uh, climate change targets in terms of what is required. And we just agree to be puppets of Western imperialism, and in the process compromise the energy security of South Africa, which if we were decisive, we could stabilize it in a much more sustainable way. Finally, as we close off, uh, what are your hopes for the next decade of the EFF? Look, the next decade of the EFF should include obviously participating 
in government and having the electoral majority, outright electoral majority to implement all the policy positions, the seven cardinal pillars that are found in the founding manifesto of the EFF. But also what should constitute the next decade, decade should be to build a pan-continental movement. In the, on the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. We are gaining traction in, particularly Namibia. I mean, like we've got two members of parliament who are elected Namibian economic freedom fighters. Same principles, same uh, regalia. They, they actually accept the leadership of the EFF South Africa. I think there will be some better traction in Ghana as well. There will be better traction in Liberia and Liberia we're beginning to gain a solid traction. There are people who are trying in Zimbabwe, but uh, some of them are exiled, so they can't have the necessary impact because they're not based in, in, in Zimbabwe. In Eswatini, the EFF was at the forefront of the uprisings that happened there. So we purposefully want to build a pan-continental, a pan-Africanist economic emancipation movement because we will be misleading ourselves to think that we're just going to achieve economic emancipation here in South Africa and leaving the entire continent behind. There has to be a purposeful integration of the uh, of entire African continent. Our forefathers, those who came before us, they chose the cooperation route uh, the, to, to pan-Africanism. And they paid the cooperation route has proven to be a total disaster. We need to integrate the African continent in terms of the transport infrastructure, in terms of trade, in terms of currency, in terms of security systems, in terms of the movements of goods and people as well. We need to integrate the entire African continent. But that can only happen once we have got progressive voices in all corners of the African continent. And we as the generation of economic freedom fighters are going to be the forefront of pushing that integration agenda by making sure that in all corners of the African continent, we have a progressive economic emancipation structures that are going to push this agenda, which uh, was uh, pioneered by Kwame Nkrumah, by Sokoto Tore, by Haley Selassie, by Julius Nyerere, although he had uh, different views in the beginning, but got to realize later that the only way to achieve a common prosperity of the African continent is when we integrate it fully. And that is the agenda that we're in pursuit of. Floyd Chivambu, thank you for joining us on SMWX. Thank you very much for having us. Aye, aye. <laughs>